Namaste. So now we come to the part where Shiva begins to reveal the means of liberation. He says, beginning in verse 8, the means by which this mind, which is restless and moves about quicker than the wind, can be brought under control, is indeed the means to obtain liberation. If indeed, it indeed is what is good for those who seek the permanent reality, it itself is pure consciousness and the state of firmness. Moreover, it alone is the righteous duty to be followed by discerning aspirants. It alone is the pilgrimage to holy waters. It alone is charity. It alone is austerities. Know that there is no doubt about this. So in other words, controlling the mind is synonymous with liberation. If the mind is controlled, that's moksha. If it's not controlled, if it's acting independently, that's samsara. So the next few verses, he enlarges on this point. And finally, where does he come? Down in verse 14. He gets around to the real point, the void. But let me back up a little bit. Basically, there are two paths to enlightenment, which have thousands of variations. The Buddha says there's 84,000 doors to enlightenment. For example, in the Bhaira Vigyan Tantra, there are 112 or 113. <laughs> anyway, different, different methods or techniques. And any of those can open the door that leads to enlightenment. But how do you control the mind? Well, there are basically two methods. Will and surrender. And you see, they're completely opposite. <laughs> Either you control the mind by your will, or you control the mind by surrender. In general, the yoga paths are paths of will. They demand a discipline, a practice, a regular application of some kind of principles. And they can take a long time. The paths of surrender are like bhakti. Tantra, where you prepare yourself in a certain way and then the thing happens to you and you surrender to it. So it's my experience and the experience of many others that enlightenment happens to you. It's not something you do because there is no doer in enlightenment. There is nobody to do anything and there is no doing, no action. Because the real point is, like I said, down in verse 14, the void. And you'll find that Devi Kalatok, Devi Kalat, <laughs> Devi Kalatotra is a meditation on the void. So the void is enlightenment, emptiness, shunyata, or the adjective form is shunya, empty. Enlightenment is empty. The truth is empty. Empty of what? <laughs> False existence. What we call existence, like this world, and all the stuff and objects and phenomena in it is false existence. And what is real is only the void. That's the, the Buddhist or Shaivite formulation is the void, emptiness, shunya. 
But the Vedic or Vedantic or Upanishadic version is the positive form, Brahman. The meaning is the same. In either case, Brahman or the void never comes into being, never changes, never dies, has no location, no time, no space, no activity, no qualities, no identity, no boundaries. Uh, so this is the unconditioned absolute. And this is what we're aiming for. This is our goal. Now, the Buddha talked about right view as one of the eightfold. In fact, the first item of the eightfold noble path <clears throat> is right view. And my experience is that if you have right view, then all the rest of the other seven things just fall out of that pretty much automatically. And if you don't have right view, it doesn't matter how hard you work, how many hours you meditate or whatever, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so the whole point, the whole struggle, the whole effort of the path, why I make hundreds of videos about this stuff is to help you get right view. And what is right view? Well, that's what we've been talking about all this time. That the world, the manifestation, uh, this body, mind, personality, ego, all this stuff is false. It's not real. It's like a dream. It comes into existence at one point, exists for some time and then goes away just like a dream. You don't have to wait until the death of the body to experience or prove that. Every night when you go to sleep, the whole world disappears, isn't it? And you find yourself in another world, a different world with different rules. And you have a different body. There are different people around and crazy stuff happens. <laughs> this is the world of dreams. And it's another false reality. But it has the same quality of coming into being at one point or time and then going out of existence at another. This is what's called relative existence. Relative qualities. Conditioned existence. Conditioned by what? Conditioned by our consciousness. When we're in waking consciousness, jagrat, then we see all these objects. That's what Jagrat means, many, many. And when we're in dream, Svapna, then we see our dreams, our fantasies, our minds, hallucinations. Excuse me just a minute. But then that also disappears. And we go into deep sleep, Shushupta. In Sushupta, there's nothing. No mind, no ego, no space, no time, no actions, no boundaries. Hey, wait a minute. That's starting to sound a lot like the void, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this void, this Brahman, is so necessary to our existence that in sleep experiments, when people are deprived of this deep sleep, Sushupta, in a few days, they go mad. They start hallucinating. They can't handle it. They get schizophrenic. <laughs> we need this connection with Brahman. We need this immersion in the void regularly, every night, to stay sane, healthy, and happy. And if we don't have it, we lose it very quickly. So what is it about the void that is so nourishing, that is so protecting, that's so comfortable? Because there's nothing. Well, that's the whole point. <laughs> One time, the Buddha's chief disciple, Subhuti, 
was giving a class about nirvana, nibbana. And he was describing it like this. Huh? No objects, no consciousness even, no space, no time, no activity, no doing, no nothing. And the monks were saying, wait a minute, how come this, this is so wonderful, it's supposed to be like the ultimate, huh? and yet there's nothing. How is that possible? And if nothing is felt, how can there be happiness? And Subhuti said, that's exactly why it's so happy. <laughs> nothing is felt. See, the Buddha has characterized all perceptions as painful. And why is that? Because all per perceptions, all consciousness, involves the senses. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and the mind. So all of those senses deal with objects in the world, and those objects are all false. But because we are in delusion, we want to believe they're real. And this causes pain because they're not real. Huh? It's just like if I make a promise to you and I tell you, oh, yeah, we're going to meet tomorrow at this place at a certain time. And then we're going to do something and have some fun or whatever. And then I don't show up. I broke my promise, right? So now you're feeling some pain, some suffering, some dukkha. Why? Because you took something as real that wasn't real. You know, or how about the used car salesman? <laughs> it sells you a whole line of nonsense. And then you, you buy the car and take it home and it's, it's junk. Huh? This is dukkha. It means unsatisfactory. Why is it unsatisfactory? Because it's unpredictable. And this is one of the seven kinds of emptiness. We'll go in next time we'll go through the seven kinds of emptiness as discussed by the Buddha in the Lankavatara Sutra. But today I just want to bring up this point. Huh? You, can, you can read the text. I'll put it in the video description. <laughs> that finally... The uh, Shiva, Shiva is unconditioned consciousness. Shiva is Brahman. Shiva is neither perception nor non-perception. He's just pure awareness, totally subjective, no objects. And Devi, who's asking this question, huh, she is the manifestation she is the object, the first object. She is time, space, activity, cause and effect, and so on. She is Maya. <laughs> That's one of her names. Maha Maya Swarupini. One of her thousand names. So, <laughs> if we believe in Maya, we will be disappointed, and that's dukkha. Unsatisfactory. We thought one thing was going to happen, and something else happens instead. Has it ever happened to you? <laughs> of course it has. It happens all the time. We will perceive a certain object at a certain point in its manifestation, and from that we will project some prediction. At that what this object is going to do or be like at a certain a next time. So then at that time we come back to it again and it's staying, it's changed, it's different, it's not what we expected it to be. Uh, how many times has this happened to us? Millions and millions of times. <laughs> Happens all the time. So this is dukkha and this is why all perceptions are painful. So the Buddha says, and also Shiva says, they're both in agreement, the cure, the medicine, is emptiness. Shunya, shunyata. Uh, 
and we get this emptiness we get a dose of this emptiness every night in deep sleep so someone was asking me today how do we uh, become aware of this and meditation is one way huh? uh, there's some other techniques like using a mantra riding a mantra into sleep clinging to a mantra and then watching your body and mind fall asleep you just chant and chant and chant and chant mentally until your body is tired and your mind starts telling stories and coming up with dreams and stuff and just watch it and if you get very good at this technique you can ride it all the way into the void so to attain enlightenment we have to overcome our fear of non-existence because actually what we think of as existence is actually non-existent <laughs> and what we think of as non-existent is actually existent huh? Heraclitus said and uh, kudos to Michael McClure for pointing this out he said that which is born never was that which is unborn is eternally so what is unborn the void it has no beginning middle or end it has no boundaries no dimensions no directions no space no time no causation uh, no results no work no action no movement see this is firmness this is the actual substrate the actual rock so to speak on which everything else is built so this is always there we are always the void we are always shivam we are always brahma we are always shunya but simply we make up this story that we're mr so-and-so from kokomo you know joe schmo then this whole song and dance about who we are and all this this is just a story now in the beginning of life other people tell us these stories and we believe them because it seems right oh yeah i'm here i am i'm this body and all this stuff is happening to me and blah 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 but it's actually not true and you have to become convinced of this and if you do if you simply adopt this right view and begin looking at life from this point of view then things will happen huh bada bing bada boom <laughs> and you will not become enlightened but you will realize your enlightenment because you already are that aum tat sat aum harihi aum